one of, I think, the greatest movies of all time. Sometimes people like to say it is one of the greatest Christmas movies of all time, but I think you can just remove the Christmas label. It's one of the greatest movies of all time is the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Anybody, anybody with me? You know the story of George Bailey who experiences probably the worst day of his life. It's conflict, it's loss, it's total despair. And he finds himself completely at the end of his rope. And there's this scene when he's in his home and he's about to go rushing up the stairs and he grabs the knob on the banister and it comes off. It's loose, right? It's broken and he grabs it in his hand. And at this moment of despair, he looks at the knob and he is just like filled with rage. It represents everything in his life that is broken and disordered and not the way that it should be. And he slams it back down on the thing before he goes up the hallway to yell at his little daughter, Zuzu. And then the angel Clarence takes him on that vision tour where he gets to learn what his life or what his city and his family members would be like if he was never born. And he, or he gets a completely new perspective. His life is completely transformed and his perspective is totally changed. And so he comes back to the same moment and having his heart softened and having his gratitude filled, he then at the end of the movie goes running through the house and as he's gonna go upstairs, he grabs the same loose knob and it comes off. But this time, instead of being enraged by it, do you remember what he does? He, he kisses it. He is so thankful for it. And then he runs up the stairs and he grabs his daughter and he's like, oh, Zuzu, you know, Jimmy Stewart's voice. Oh, Zuzu. And he picks her up and he squeezes her and he hugs her. Last night, I, we were talking about this movie and this story over the dinner table and we kept using the name Zuzu. My, my three-year-old boy really liked that name. And my wife that, yes, last night had made Orzo for dinner. And when my three-year-old wanted to ask for seconds, he goes, mom, can I have more Zuzu? <laughs> He got his, his, Z, uh, his Z's mixed up. The reason that that movie and that climactic scene when he rushes into the home and he loves and kisses his wife and he embraces his daughter and he even cherishes the little knob, the reason that that's so moving and the reason that it makes me cry every time I watch it is because it is such a powerful illustration of a second chance, right? He got given another opportunity and this story in Jonah chapter three is all about a second chance, a powerful second chance. Jonah, if you've been tracking with the story, received instructions from God and disobeyed and dishonored and disregarded those instructions. He ran away from God and God would have been altogether just to let him run and to move on to another prophet. And yet in Jonah chapter three, we're going to see him get another chance to do what God called him to do. But the second chances don't start with, stop with Jonah. We're going to see also the city of Nineveh, this godless, wicked, violent people receive a second chance to not get what they deserve, but rather to receive the kindness of God. And what's so powerful and so compelling about Jonah chapter three is that neither Jonah nor the Ninevites did anything to deserve a second chance. They didn't earn it. They weren't good enough for it. God didn't look at them and say, well, you know, you've checked enough boxes, so I guess I'll give you a second chance. I owe it to you. The wonder of Jonah chapter three and the wonder of God's mercy is that he does not give us what we deserve. This is such good news, especially for people like you and me who are so used to a meritocracy. Right? We're used to a world that tells us we get what we deserve. Right, So we want to we wanna earn it. We want to be good enough for it. We want to work hard at it and achieve it. And the kingdom of God is nothing like that. And that's good news for you and for me because no matter how hard we work, no matter what we do, no matter what boxes we check, no matter what rituals or routines we perform, we cannot make ourselves good enough to deserve the love of God but he gives it anyways. This is the best news in the world. We're gonna learn it with such clarity in Jonah chapter three. We're gonna learn this, that the God who pursues moves in mercy. 
the God who pursues moves in mercy, which means that he does not give people what they have earned. In fact, he withholds what people deserve. This is a staggering display of the kindness of God. It is a It is a characteristic of God that you and I desperately need as those who cannot earn his love and his grace. And so I want to turn our attention to Jonah chapter three. I want to hear the word of the Lord and then we'll unpack this great and merciful display of God's kindness. Jonah chapter three and verse one says this, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey and he called out, Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. He issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone who turns from his evil way, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Verse nine, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them and he did not do it. The God who pursues. This is the God that we're learning about in Jonah. A God who does not passively wait for his people, but who actively pursues them. Those who are far away from him, those who don't know him, those who don't deserve a shot at relationship with him. We are learning through Jonah that he is a God who pursues. And in Jonah chapter three, that we see this God is a God who moves in mercy, who joyfully, who delights to withhold what we deserve. That we're gonna find is going to be very, very good news. And what we see here in Jonah is we see the kind of effect that that mercy should have on people. Because it's one thing for people like you and me to like read in a theology textbook, God is merciful. And to say, oh, that's nice. That is a data point. But what we what we must understand is that if there is a God who pursues, and if that God who pursues actually is a merciful God, it should change us from the inside out. Our lives should be different in the way that we interact with God and the way that we interact with the world and the way that we interact with others because we have been spared what we deserve. His mercy doesn't just leave us the way we are. His mercy transforms us and makes us new from the inside out. And so what is that response? If I interact with the God who moves in mercy, how should I respond? And I want to show you in the text three displays of the mercy of God, the God who moves in mercy, and then three ways that you and I should respond to the mercy of God. We'll take them one by one. God's mercy and your response. Here's the first one. He restores. So stop your running. He restores, so stop your running. The book of Jonah is all about a prophet who runs. We we might not even have the events of the book of Jonah recorded in the way that they are if the story had not started with an abysmal failure by God's prophet. Right, The word of the Lord came to Jonah in chapter one and instead of obeying God, he ran from God. He heard the will of God. He saw what was desired as the work of God and he decided to run headlong in the opposite direction. And what happens here is so powerful because God doesn't just let him go. God doesn't condemn him. He doesn't release him. He doesn't fire him. He doesn't neglect him. He restores his prophet who runs. 
Last week, we, or two weeks ago, before Easter, we saw in chapter two, the repentance of Jonah, the turning of Jonah in the belly of the fish. And now in verse one of chapter three, we get the restoring grace of God. Notice it says, in the exact same words as the beginning of the book, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah. That's exactly how the book began. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah. But you'll notice here that there's no There's no scolding, there's no shaming, there's no reproaching, there's no rebuking. There's just the kindness of God to speak to Jonah again. How kind, how awesome that God just gives this failure another shot. Aren't you thankful that God gives failures another shot? I mean, the Bible is full of these stories. Moses was a murderer. David was an adulterer. Saul was a church persecutor. Peter was a Christ denier. And every single one of them in the aftermath of their abysmal failures did not get dismissed by God. They got restored by God. They got another chance. They got recommissioned. They got invited in. They were allowed to participate in the work of God in the world. It is good news that God restores failures and that God works with failures because those, newsflash, are the only kind of people he has to work with. Right, God's hiring pool is you and me. Bunch of jack wagons who have no idea what we're doing, who constantly disobey him, always fail him, live our lives at times to dishonor him. And how kind that he does not dismiss us. He is willing to restore us. He's willing to come to us again and say, here is my word and to patiently plead with us and teach us and welcome us back into his fold. This is a God of mercy. If God was not a God of mercy, he would have watched Jonah sail off to Tarshish and let him go to the destruction that awaited him. But he did not. He sent the wind and he sent the sailors and he sent the fish because he wanted to speak to Jonah again. So I just want to plead with you for a moment. I mean, think about it. A God who is this kind, a God who is this good, a God who is this generous is not a God that we should run from. He is a God that we should run to. I mean, come on. We run away from people we think are going to hurt us. We run away from people we don't trust. We run away from people who think, we think they have our worst at heart, who are malevolent, who are angry, who are evil. And God over and over and over again has proved the tenderness of his compassion, his willingness to forgive, that he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So like Jonah did, if in fact we come into contact with this merciful God, we should stop running away from him. We should stop and turn towards him and say, all right, God, I'm on your program. What do you want me to do? How can I participate in the work that you are doing in the world? This is what Jonah models for us in his response here, because what's so powerful The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Here's his second chance. And here's the instructions again, verse two. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and uh, and call out against it the message that I give you. And then verse three, once again, these are the exact same words in the beginning of the book. So Jonah arose and, but a lot has happened since the last time he heard some instructions, right? I mean, he, he spent three days in the guts of a fish, for goodness sake, repented, came to God, was vomited out on the shore, and then the word of the Lord came to him a second time. Same word, different prophet, at least in a different state. And instead of the text saying, so Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish, the text says, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. What an awesome testimony of God's grace in Jonah's life where he once disobeyed and disregarded the command of God, he now obeys. I wonder where it is in your life that you have been running away from the clear command of God. And when you come into contact with the goodness and compassion of his heart, you just need to recognize that running away is not the best thing for you. You need to stop running You need to stop excusing. You need to stop minimizing. You need to turn to God and say, God, what do you want me to do? 
I will do what you command me to do because I believe that your will for my life is good, that you love me with the heart of a father and that you never command anything that wouldn't be for my blessing and for my joy. Where do we need to stop running from God, receive his mercy and obey him? Jonah, Jonah has learned here, like I love this. <laughs> I would imagine at some point God convinced Jonah that if he wanted to reach the Ninevites, he was gonna reach the Ninevites, whether or not Jonah was included, right? You would imagine Jonah gets vomited up on the shore and he's like, all right, I guess God's gonna do the job one way or the other. (laughs) And he might as well use me. This is the thing. God is a sovereign God. And if he wants to get something done, he's going to get it done. And he's gonna do it with or without you or me. But how kind that he lovingly invites us to participate in the work that he is doing. He invites us to be part of what he wants to get done. And if we decide, oh, I'm not going to do that, it's not God who suffers, it's us. We are the ones who suffer because we miss out on God's good and kind invitation to be part of his kingdom and to build his church and advance the message of his grace. So God's mercy and your response first, he restores. So stop your running like Jonah does. He goes to Nineveh, this exceedingly great city, It says it would take three days to walk around, which means it's miles and miles and miles, hundreds of thousands of people in the domain that he is sent to preach to. And let's see what happens. Here's the second way to respond to the mercy of God. He speaks, so heed the warning. He speaks, so heed the warning. Verse four tells us that Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, as a preacher, I find myself so curious about all the details we don't have here. So I'm wondering, like, the first questions that come to my mind right away are like, is this all that he said? Is this exactly what God told him to say? Like, what was the context of his say it? Did he march around the city? Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown and just keep repeating it over and over again. Is this like a summary of his message? Did he walk through the streets and just yell it for whoever would hear? Did the king say he would organize a worship service and Jonah gets up to preach and they had heard the fishermen on the shore say, this guy got spit up by a whale. You should probably listen to what he says. Like he came out of the mouth of the fish. He was alive. He's probably got something interesting to say. I don't know what the context was. Probably most remarkable to me is that the guy who had just received ridiculous grace doesn't make a mention of it for these people. Did you notice? It is purely a message of coming judgment and therefore it is a warning. This is a warning from God. In Hebrew, it is five words. And the five words mean what's said there. You have 40 days, Nineveh. And in 40 days time, this city is going to be destroyed. Now, I have to imagine that in the heart of Jonah, when God gave him that message, hey, I'm gonna destroy Nineveh. Go and tell them that. I have to imagine Jonah was like, oh boy, yes. I get to go tell the Ninevites they're going to get roasted from fire by heaven. I guess it's coming. The city's going to be destroyed. So I, maybe he had like a little pep in his step as he walked through the city. Like, you guys are going to be destroyed. He, he was probably at some part of his heart hoping that it was a prediction, but God meant it as a warning. God meant it as a warning. And this is what God does in his mercy is he warns. We talked about this last week. If God did not love the Ninevites, he would have been silent. He would not have sent them a prophet. He would not have warned them of coming judgment. He would have kept his mouth closed, sent none of his people there, and allowed them to sail off into the destruction that their sin had surely earned. Remember, the Ninevites were undeniably wicked people. History well records their heinous acts of evil and imperialism and exploitation. They were awful and they deserved what Jonah described. They deserved it. But God in his mercy is a God who speaks a word of warning. 
Now, I know we don't like to think about this. I mean, it made me think this week of the most famous sermon that was ever preached in American history. It was preached in July 1841 by a preacher named Jonathan Edwards. And if you studied high school English, you will know the title of the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now, in this cultural moment, that message, which is designed from the word of God to induce a sense of fear of the coming wrath of God against my sin, that sort of message is despised in our cultural moment. If Jonathan Edwards was preaching today, canceled. Get that guy out of here for his hatred and his bigotry and his close-mindedness. How could you speak like that about God? But here's the reality. Like, I understand that response unless what he's saying is true. Unless God is real and righteous and justly angry about sin, then what Jonathan Edwards is doing is providing a valuable service to those who are condemned before a holy God unless they receive his warning and receive his grace. This is, this is the love of God that warns. It is not the malicious intent of God. It is not the evil of God. Our culture hates this moment. They say, tell us about the love of God. Just be quiet about the wrath of God. But here's the problem. God is all of who he is. And it is actually his goodness and his love that leads him to have wrath that against that which destroys what he loves, which is sin. God is a God of wrath and therefore a warning of the wrath to come in order that you might receive his mercy is an expression of his love. And here's how I know, right? We understand this in other areas of our life that bad news is a good thing if it leads us to a good result. We know that this is true. Sometimes we actually long to receive bad news. We know it is a good thing if it will lead us to a good result. And here's how I know. If you go to the doctor this week for your yearly checkup and your doctor does a scan and finds a malignant tumor, stage four cancer that will kill you unless it is operated on, you expect your doctor to tell you the bad news because you understand that is the only way to receive life-saving treatment. Bad news is a good thing when it leads you to a good result. And so a God of love warns of coming judgment for these Ninevites in order that we might receive the warning and get the life-saving treatment of his mercy. This is the kindness of God, guys. It's on display, his mercy And we would do well to listen up, to heed this bad news, just like we see the people of Nineveh do. Look at at verse five. I can imagine all kinds of ways that the people of Nineveh could have responded to this prophet. This very strange looking, perhaps smelly, scholars think that perhaps his skin was bleached white from the stomach acid of the whale. So this dude's looking like all kinds of alien And he's in there and he's preaching and he's saying, you have 40 days and this city's going to be destroyed. And I can think of a whole bunch of ways that they could respond. Remember, these are like evil, violent, wicked people. They could just execute him. They could torture him. They could mock him. They could dismiss him. They could do all kinds of things. But what do they do? Verse five, the people of Nineveh believed God. The people of Nineveh believed God. This is what I would plead with you to do today. Believe God. Believe what God says about his character. Believe what he says about his holiness. Believe what he says about his wrath. Believe what he says about coming judgment. Why? Not so that you can have this like warped picture of an angry God, but so that you can receive the mercy that he delights to give. This is what happens when anyone receives a warning. And we're gonna see it miraculously displayed here in just a moment. They take God seriously. They listen to his warning. And we're gonna see the result in just a moment. Here's the third response to God's mercy. God's mercy in your response, he relents, so turn from sinning. He relents, so turn from sinning. 
what we have described at the end of chapter five is then kind of expanded in verses six through eight. And what we see is we see the word reached the king of Nineveh. So Jonah's message traveled all the way to the king's court, to his throne. And what we see here is a an incredible response, both personally and officially, from this ruler of the entire city. It says, he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. So here's the personal response of the king, and it's, it's powerfully poetic. It's actually like perfectly balanced. If you'll notice, it begins, he arose from his throne, and he took off his robe, And then he reverses both of those actions. He put on sackcloth and he sat down once more, but this time not on a throne, he sat in ashes. And this is meant to tell you that this king believed that Jonah's message was true and that the cause of God's coming judgment wasn't some person or problem out there, it was him. Because he could sit on his throne and be like, oh, you guys are so evil, you better fix this. But he leads with a personal act of repentance. Gets up out of his throne, takes off his robe, puts on sackcloth, sits in ashes, and then he goes a step further. He issues an official proclamation that that calls for four things. Four demonstrations of the contrition, the repentance of all of these people. Look what it says. He issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. So he says, first, we are going to fast, which means we're not going to eat or drink as a symbol of our internal grief and need over our sin. Number two, we're going to wear sackcloth, which is a a horribly uncomfortable garment, which is intended to remind you of the wretchedness and the discomfort of sin. And then he says, we are going to call out to God. Whatever God it is that this Jonah represents, we are going to cry out to him with everything that we have. And then he says, we are going to turn from our evil and the violence in our hands. Now, this is an act of desperation before God. Notice that they don't make excuses. They don't minimize their sin. They don't try to argue with God and say, I think you're overreacting a little bit. Like it's not that big of a deal. They don't do any of that. They are down on their faces in expressions of need for God's mercy. They are so desperate. Did you notice there? It's like neither man nor beast. He's like everyone in the city fast and pray. The cows fast and pray. The pigs put on sackcloth. Everyone and everything in this city before God humbled in the reality of our sin and our need for his mercy. They are desperately crying out to God. And then notice that all of this is done, not even on the promise that God will relent, but just a whisper of a hope. Do you see it? Verse nine, who knows God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. This king had no real reason to believe that God wouldn't do what their sin deserved, but he hoped maybe God will not do what he said he would do. And miracle of miracles, that's exactly what happened. God relented of the disaster. God did not destroy the city of Nineveh the way that he said he would. We see this supernatural response, a divine deliverance, the entire city laid low before God. And then these words in verse 10, he did not do it. When he saw how they turned from their evil way, God relented and he did not do it. This this is the way that God has always worked. God is a God who never changes. 
God doesn't change his mind. God doesn't turn around. God doesn't repent. God doesn't ever need to change the way that he operates. What we see here is not that God changed. We see the people changed. God's consistent disposition towards his people, his promise to his people and even to people who don't know him all the time is if you remain stubbornly committed to your sin, I will oppose you. And if you humble yourself and come to me in repentance, I will lavish my mercy upon you. It's not God who changed, it's the people who changed. Do you see that? God has always said, I will oppose you in your sin and I will give mercy to you in your repentance. And the people of Nineveh went from stubbornly committed to sin to laid low before God in repentance and he gave them what he said. He would always give people who operated like that. He gave them his grace and he is still doing it today. These stories of baptism that we've celebrated this morning and the ones that we'll celebrate next service, these are all demonstrations of the willingness of God to withhold what we deserve and rather lavish upon us what we could not earn. His love, his favor, his blessing, his restoration, his reconciliation. That's what he did for these people in Nineveh. And he did it for them the exact same way that he does it for us. He did it through the finished work of his son, Jesus Christ. You can make no mistake that on the day that God did not pour out his wrath on the Ninevites, the Bible tells us he was storing up wrath for the day when he would pour it out on his own son, Jesus, at the cross. And then that same hope that was only a future reality for those who lived in the Old Covenant in the Old Testament has now been accomplished. We celebrated it last weekend at Good Friday and Easter that Jesus hung on the cross to bear the wrath that we deserve for our sin so that God would no longer give it to us. And then he rose from the dead three days later conquering the power of of the grave so that we could have the gift of eternal life. And by God's mercy, what in the old covenant was a future hope is now a fulfilled reality. And we look back and know that all of our debt, all of our shame, all of our guilt has been washed away at the cross of Jesus Christ. And now we are free. What we deserve is the wrath of God, but what we get instead is his love. That, my friends, is mercy. The same mercy that God showed to the Ninevites is the mercy that he gives to you and me when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. And when God shows us his mercy, it transforms us from the inside out so that what we want to do is what the Ninevites did. We want to cease from our sinning. We want to turn away from our wicked ways and we want to pursue God in his holiness. Why? Because we believe that he has fullness of joy and everlasting fulfillment in his presence because we actually believe when he says in Jeremiah chapter two that if you live apart from me, it's like you're digging out wells that are dry as a bone. You have broken cisterns that will never satisfy you and I am the well of living water. You can come to me and be satisfied. So when we experience freedom because of the mercy of God, it is not freedom to sin, it is freedom from sin. It's freedom to stop our sinning, to turn away from it and to turn towards God. And we do that because he relents from disaster. We do that because he's a God of mercy. Such a powerful illustration here to the Ninevites and to Jonah that the God who pursues moves in mercy. I was reminded this week of something that made national news in 2015 when at a midweek Bible study at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, a young man named Dylan walked into a a little gathering and he shot nine people dead. Months later, after murdering these people in the church, there was his court hearing, which was publicized. And the families of victims got to get up and speak directly to Dylan. And one of them got up and looked at Dylan and just overflowed with the kind of hatred that you would expect 
Like the, the reasonable response to someone who did that to your family member and just just spewed this like vitriol and a, a quote. This person looked at Dylan and said, you are going to burn in hell. Now, there is a powerful contrast to that. When this older lady, a sister of one of the men who had been murdered, took the stand immediately after, looked at this young man in the face and said, I forgive you. I forgive you. And the national news media covered it, asking this question, like, why in the world would you forgive somebody who did this to your family? And she said, why? She said, I have been forgiven. And so I am able to forgive no matter the severity of the offense. And this is, this is what mercy does. If you have received mercy, if you have interacted with the God who gives mercy, you will never be the same. It transforms you from the inside out. You are spared what you, have des- what you deserved. And so you are then able to go out and to love and to extend grace and mercy and forgiveness to those who even wrong you. This is the supernatural, miraculous, transforming power of encountering the God who moves in mercy. May we always be those who are well aware of the mercy that we have received so that we stop running from God. We open our ears and we listen to God and we turn from our sin in order to obey and honor God. May we be the people of mercy and may God extend the reach of his grace through us for his glory. Let's pray.